Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, today, I will talk uh, about uh, quantum computing with uh, two dimensional conformal field theories. And this is based on uh, work uh, done with my collaborators and my advisor. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the outline of uh, the talk. I will start by talking a bit about uh, topological quantum computation, which is uh, a field with uh, many different onion models. And more specifically, I will give an example about the easing onions, which will later be connected to a conformal field theory, and more specifically, the easing minimal model M. 4,3, and this uh, connection will be clear uh, when studying the fraction quantum Hall effect at uh, filling 5 over 2. And one tries to create a constructive wave function, the, the Murid wave function for these easing onions using conformal blocks from this CFT. After talking about this, uh, our goal is to try to find different conformal field theories that could potentially generalize this Murid wave function and get different breaking statistics. Uh, okay, let's talk about a topological quantum computation. This is uh, one of the many different architectures for having a quantum computer which uh, has uh, the advantage of allowing us to encode and process information in a fault tolerant way by design. And that way we don't really have to worry that much about errors and it's easier in principle to scale up the system. Uh, this is uh, accomplished using certain quasi particles called anions which live in two spatial dimensions and exhibit a quantum statistics that is neither bosonic nor fermionic. Actually, we have two types of anions. We can have the Yeah. Um... Sorry yes. if I interrupt you. Well, just a question. No, no. Yes. Do you know if uh, anions have been experimentally observed? Yes. They have been. Uh, I have it on uh, some uh, fla at fraction quantum Hall effect at a filling one over three. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, so this is the fraction. but we don't have clear evidence yet for non-abelian onions. It is okay? Yes, yes, okay, thanks. Okay, okay yeah. However, the, uh, we, we actually cannot, uh, we cannot use abelian onions for quantum computation. It turns out that uh, because the, there is just a global phase, all the quantum gates that we can uh, we can construct from them, they're going to be trivial. They're going to be proportional to the identity. So they are not very useful. Uh, that's why we are more interested in the non-abelian onions case, where we can actually have something very complicated, which will allow us to do useful calculations. And uh, the question is, uh, what type of uh, systems uh, can probably be used in, uh, for topological quantum computation? And we're going to say that uh, we are looking for systems with topolo topological order or topo um, systems in a topological phase of matter. And these systems actually have uh, these three important properties. Of course, there are uh, anionic excitations. There's an energy gap and there's a ground state degeneracy. And uh, th those two, the, the last two are very important because 
using the degeneracy of the ground states, we can actually define the computational subspace, which is going to be protected by errors because of this gap. Uh, this degeneracy that I just mentioned can always be uh, can also be understood in terms of uh, the fusion rules of anions. If we have two anions and we bring them, let's say that we have an anion phi A and another one phi B, uh, they can fuse and they can give different outcomes. If the, there is a single outcome, then we're talking about um, a billion anions, and this is this this is the case but if, if we have uh, multiple outcomes then we're talking about non-obillion onions and it's these uh, multiple channels that we're getting in the case of the non-obillion onions that actually help us to create this degenerate uh, subspace and encode information and construct the qubit uh, after that uh, since now we have the qubit uh, when we want to know how we can actually create a quantum gates. And uh, the idea is uh, that we can do that by exchanging anions, or in a more fancy language, we can uh, braid their word lines. So for example, here we have three anions, uh, and uh, we exchange the first and the second, and we're gonna get uh, something like this, which uh, is gonna represent a quantum gate. And the advantage here is that um, this uh, construction is actually uh, uh, resistant to local uh, small perturbations. For example, if there is some uh, external noise from the environment and uh, the trajectory of uh, the first onion changes a bit, we don't really have to worry because all we care is about the winding of the first particle Onion around the second. We still we still have to be a bit careful because if the if the error is very big, then uh, we're we're gonna end up with the wrong braiding. So there is a case where the first uh, onion will go around the third instead of the second. So we still have a possibility for errors, but they are like uh, easy to handle. And we just have to be a bit careful. Ilya, <clears throat> yes. Is this really the physical space? Like when you say braiding, you really mean that um, you just swap the positions of the particles? Yes. So okay, okay. The title can be a bit uh, uh, confusing. So I say two-dimensional CFTs, and uh, uh, I didn't talk about two dimensions yet. Uh, right now, I'm talking about three dimensions. So sure, but yeah. So the, the slides are the, showing the, 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 the physical space. dimensions. Yes, yes. <laughs> and this is the space, uh, the time. Sorry. So how do you exchange the two onions? How, how do you exchange them? There is an operator that does this, or how do you exchange them? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, actually, that's a, a first of all. It, it really depends on. Uh, uh, the system that you are going to try to find uh, the onions. First of all, we don't have braidings yet. We don't have a very good topological qubit to, to begin with. So if uh, the qubit uh, is placed on, uh, if, uh, if the onions uh, lies on, uh, for example, one example is that uh, you, you might have onions on a superconduct semiconductor nanowires and then the two onions will live on the edges of the nanowire so you just have to carefully move and uh, like transport the nanowire so that's one case but it really depends on uh, uh, the kind of experiment that you're doing to create the onions so you can just exchange the winding because that's the where what may, can you not exchange the winding number because that's the character so I, I I said the winding number because uh, uh, well winding one particle around the 
moving one particle around a second or exchange them is it's pretty much the same it's actually why because winding numbers in general are protected they're they're integers so they remain constant yes 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 so it should from my understanding it shouldn't be the same intuitively no because it what no, are you saying that, no, uh, this, no. In the, sorry go ahead no please go ahead okay so are you saying that uh, so what i'm saying is that uh, here in these two pictures the winding number is the same okay so indeed it is protected but uh, take for example the case where the error is that big that actually moves the first onion around the third that would like give a different winding right uh, why i mean usually winding numbers because they don't have to be the same right they don't have to be the same type of onions okay yeah, it's not clear to me. Maybe go on and then we. Yeah, okay. Here because yeah, we, can... we interrupted you too much. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can. Uh, uh, it's okay. You can interrupt me in time. Uh, oh. Well, I forgot uh, what I, where did I stop. <laughs> I think I, I said that uh, we have the topological protection and we still have some errors, but uh, we have to be careful. Okay, let's move on. So, uh, one of the most popular. Uh, models for topological quantum computation is based on the easing onion model. Uh, in this uh, case, we have uh, three types of particles. We have the easing onion, sigma, we have a fermion, psi, and we have the vacuum, uh, which is going to be denoted by I. We have uh, the following non-trivial fusion rules. And the most important here is that uh, if you fuse two sigmas, you have have two different channels, you might get uh, the vacuum or you might get a fermion. Using this, we can actually define a qubit. We'll start with uh, three easing onions and we're going to fuse them together. And uh, we know that at the end, we're going to end up with another sigma onion. This is just based on the fusion rules. But we can see that in the intermediate state, we might have a vacuum or we might have a fermion. And these are going to be the two states, the zero and the one for the qubit. Now, having that, we can also braid the onions. We can braid uh, the first two. And uh, this is going to generate this uh, matrix, which is uh, diagonal. And uh, we can braid the second and the third which is going to create this uh, non-diagonal matrix. And it turns out that uh, with these uh, two matrices, we can do uh, we can quantum gates, but not all the quantum gates that one might need. So this is a good model for topological quantum computation, but it doesn't give universal quantum computation based on just braidings. Is it clear how you read these matrices from the top? Wait, what? How you derive? Yeah, is it clear from this picture or? Uh... No, it's not clear at all. OK, OK. Uh, so, there, uh, so the traditional way to, do, to derive these matrices is uh, based on, uh, it's based on uh, the fusion rules and uh, something called the Pentagon uh, uh, diagram. So it's actually a self consistent uh, co consistency equation that uh, you just have to apply the braiding like a bunch of times and then check with uh, the fusion rules. And then, in order for the fusion rules to make sense, then there have to be some constraints. And that's how you get this uh, braiding matrices. But uh, here, I, I will give a different way to get this matrices based on conformal field theories. Thanks. <clears throat> so, so as I said, that uh, this is a good model, but not uh, the best because uh, we don't have a universal quantum computation. 
Uh, now, a good question is uh, where exactly in nature can we find these uh, anions? Because what I mentioned bef before is just pure theory. Uh, one approach is to look at uh, superconducting, semiconducting nanowires. And uh, the, in, in this approach, uh, people have been trying to detect on the edges of these nanowires, which uh, actually have the same braiding statistics as the Ising anions. And uh, another approach is the fraction quantum hall effect that I will actually focus here. There is uh, experimental data that support the existence of uh, a billion anions on the filling one over three. There is some evidence that uh, we might have uh, easing anions at the filling five over two. And then there is even less evidence that uh, we might have Fibonacci anions at uh, the level 12 by 5. And the advantage of the Fibonacci anions that I didn't really mention so far is that uh, this is a different model for quantum computation, which actually is universal. So we can have actually any possible quantum gate just by braiding. So Abelian and Ising are not universal. Well, uh, yes, and a billion is even worse than uh, aging because a billion will the uh, the change in the exchanging the uh, two billion anions will uh, just produce a phase. So that means that any matrix is going to be just proportional to the identity. So it's not going to be a very very good idea to build a quantum computer based on them. Is this clear? But in a multi multipartite system, generating a local phase is a non-trivial operation. It's not a global phase necessarily, right? So if I do if I do one braiding, mm -hmm. right? If I have a start it is going to be it is going to be a, a global phase. I guess uh, what you're saying can be done if you can manage to have different superpositions of, so you, you need to have a setup where you have some abelian anions in some state, and then you need to superpose them with another identical, but a bit different, and then change only. So it is gonna be a global phase in, in, uh, in the context that at least I understand it. So if you manage somehow to make it a, a relative phase, then it can be useful. Okay. But uh, I don't see how you can do that. But I guess it's interesting. Well, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, well, as I promised, uh, we can, uh, there's some connection. Uh, of uh, be uh, between the fraction quantum Hall effect and uh, conformal field theories. And this connection is going to be very, very useful because if one wants to understand the fraction quantum Hall effect systems and understand the statistics of these uh, excitations, one needs to solve a, a very complicated many body Hamiltonian, which is very, very hard to brute force. And uh, therefore, there's uh, an, alternate, an alternative that uh, uh, tells us that, uh, for example, uh, if we want to find the wave function for this particular, the ground state wave function for this particular feeling, one over three, we can construct the wave function, which is called Lollings wave function, just based on Shifty. And the second example is uh, the Murid wave function, which uh, describes the filling uh, 5 over 2. And this can be constructed using conformal blocks from the Ising model M4,3. Uh, and now the question is uh, whether or not we can use different CFEs to get different 
uh, wave functions. Uh, to understand uh, this question uh, and uh, also understand a bit uh, better the connection between Moore-Reed uh, wave function and the minimal model, we're going to actually uh, briefly talk about uh, generic uh, minimal models in the Coulomb gas formalism. Uh, in this, uh, one starts with a massless scalar field in two space-time dimensions. So now it's, it's one plus one and adds a background charge by just coupling this uh, scalar field to the curvature. And the coupling constant is going to be proportional to the background charge. All the physical uh, observables of the theory are going to be represented by primary fields, which uh, are going to be expressed as vertex operators. Uh, here is an example of a vertex operator. So one mistake that I made here is uh, this phi is the same as this phi. Uh, don't get confused by that. Uh, here, uh, the primary fields are parameterized by two integers, the r and the s. r takes, value from, takes values from 1 to k, and s takes values from 1 to k plus 1. And in general, we have a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic part. But uh, when we are dealing with uh, correlators, uh, it turns out that we can actually uh, decompose this uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part and do the calculation separately. And each of these uh, primary fields is going to have a, a certain conformal dimension and a certain charge given by these uh, two formulas. Uh, before we go into the more interesting case of building uh, correlators, uh, we need the two more ingredients. So the first one is the conjugate field. Uh, it turns out that uh, for every primary field, there is a conjugate field that has the same conformal dimension, but different charges. And we can also introduce the screening charges Q plus and minus which has zero conformal dimension, but it carries some charge. It's going to be plus or obviously plus one or minus one. Now, if one wants to construct uh, an amplitude for N uh, primary fields like this, eventually he will have to modify this amplitude by inserting some conjugate fields and some screen charges. And the number uh, of uh, screening charges and conjugate fields will have to be such that uh, the charge neutrality condition will be satisfied. That means that uh, the total charge inside the correlator will have to be twice the background charge. Otherwise, the amplitude is going to vanish. OK, so now let's go to a specific example. Uh, let's talk about the four-point function of the field uh, phi 1, comma 2. Mm, sorry. Okay. Uh, of course, this correlator uh, has to be uh, corrected a bit in order to obey the charge neutrality condition. For that, we're going to add a negative screening charge, and we're going to replace one of the fields by its conjugate. Without a loss of uh, generality, we're gonna replace the last one by its conjugate, and we're gonna introduce the Q minus. Uh, using conformal invariance, uh, we can actually simplify this amplitude by setting eta one to zero, eta to, to x, at a 3 to 1, and at a 4 to infinity. So we can always fix the three points from this uh, amplitude. And then we can proceed to evaluate this. It turns out that this is going to be a contour integral. And we have to be very careful because these points uh, are actually branch points, and they also have uh, some pole singularities. 
So we'll need to uh, add some branch cards. And uh, if one does all these uh, calculations uh, very carefully, you'll uh, realize that um, there are actually two independent contour choices. We can go around uh, the zero and the x, or we can go around the one and infinity. defining these two conformal blocks. So the first one goes from x uh, from 0 to x, and the second goes from 1 to infinity. And uh, while here in the integrand, we have uh, something complicated that I chose to ignore uh, for, 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 for this slide. And uh, if uh, one that, uh, does the calculations, uh, we, we see that uh, these two conformal blocks are, in general, some uh, Hyper, hyper geometric functions. Now, uh, using uh, OPs on uh, the first two fields, we can uh, identify this conformal block by this diagram, where the intermediate state is the field uh, phi 1, 1. Uh, Ilya, I, I yes. don't see your transparencies moving. Wait, what? I I don't see the cursor. Uh, no, uh, I think you are frozen into the previous transparency. I don't know. You guys can seriously? You see that one? Yeah, uh, can you tell me the number? Eleven. Four, four point amplitude slide. Oh, okay. Wait. Okay, this is very confusing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see now? Now it's number 12, right? Okay, so, okay. Okay, so you saw this uh, slide. Okay, this do, you, do you have any question about this slide? Let's go like this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how do you know, how can you show that after doing the replacement of phi with phi tilde and q, you get the same... So you're saying that to guarantee that the charge is the same, you um, make I don't replacement. Want... Oh. You choose some phi's and you replace them. You replace them with phi tilde q, q plus or q minus or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but and... uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that the charge is going to be the same. Uh, so... But the condition has to be respected. Yes, that is the exactly. criterion, right? But how do you know that you get the same amplitude? I mean, with a condition being satisfied, that it describes but the same. You're not going to get the same amplitude. You that's, want to... that's the point. Uh, so the point is that, uh, let's go back here. So uh, we have, have a, a certain set of uh, primary fields. And uh, you can actually see that uh, in this set, that is defined by RNS, uh, for every uh, conformal dimension, there are two charges. For example, let's take about uh, let's talk about the one and two. The, if R is one and S is two, then that operator, that field, has a certain conformal charge, a uh, conformal dimension, and a certain charge. But then it's going to be another field that has uh, the same conformal dimension but different charge. Okay, that is going to be the three two. You, you don't have to check that. You can trust me at least on this one. OK, there are two different, uh, there, there are uh, two operators with the same dimension, but different charge. OK. But since they have the same dimension, they represent the same physical quantity. OK, so. Now, if you try to evaluate the. any conjugate field just with using just the first type of uh, operator sometimes the and without using any screen charge sometimes this condition is not satisfied that means that uh, that amplitude uh, is zero uh, or 
that it's a technicality that you're not using the right formula to compute it well actually that, there's a problem okay. with, because uh if, if if this is not satisfied there is a problem uh so this one uh, this uh, field has a u1 u1 symmetry okay and uh if uh if we do a transformation if we take a phi to phi plus a whatever then uh, we are going to see that uh, inside the correlator we're going to do this uh, transformation we're going to see that if uh, the charge neutrality condition is not satisfied then we're not getting the same results this this correlator are different but they shouldn't be different um I think I understand what you mean by having to do the replacement to get the right result if you want. Okay. But at the same time, because this is reminiscent of something that happens also in string theory amplitudes, where you have to make such replacements to guarantee non vanishing. Well, amplitude. these are actually tools used in string theory. Okay. Okay. Fine. But the whole point is that you can do this replacement because there's some operator, like the BRST operator of the, the given theory that you're using with which before and this is basically what allows you to make the replacement otherwise it would be a different physical state so a different amplitude in, in generically that basically that's what i'm asking what is the brst operator here okay uh well what i can say here is that uh, uh well unfortunately i'm not very familiar with that because uh when you want to study this uh, uh minimal models there are, uh, there are many ways, and what I'm using right now, I'm using the Coulomb uh, gas formalism, which was uh, given, I guess, uh, by uh, Dochenko and Fatif. And there, there are many different approaches, and the, the BRST uh, that you said is one of the approaches, but I'm not familiar with that. So I cannot. Uh, and this, uh, I cannot answer your question. Like, oh, that's all right. You, you explained a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, more questions here? No. So, what I was saying is that uh, because of this, uh, well, branch points, we have to be very careful and we're going to end up with two independent contour choices. The first one is gonna uh, be from uh, zero to X. And the other one is gonna be from one to infinity. And these two uh, conformal blocks uh, can actually be, uh, uh, well, if one does the calculations analytically, he will realize that this is actually, these are actually two hypergeometric functions. And uh, now, on top of that, we can actually uh, use the OP and then we can identify this conformal block with this uh, diagram and this one with uh, this one. And uh, what we see here is that uh, in the first one, in the intermediate state, we have a field phi 1, 1. And in the second diagram, we have a uh, field phi one comma three. Okay, and these two conformal blocks are gonna be are gonna they're gonna form the basis for the qubit. And uh, we can of course uh, find the exchange matrices simply by going uh, on these uh, definitions of the conformal blocks and exchanging. Eta one with eta two and eta one with eta three. If one does that, then uh, we can find uh, these two matrices. Of, of again, the first one is uh, a diagonal matrix, and the second one is a non-diagonal. And in the case of uh, the minimal model for uh, comma three, which is for k equals to two, we see that. Uh, the first matrix R1, one, one, uh, one, two, is actually exactly the same as the braiding matrix of the Ising anions. 
So this one reduces to this one and we can get the second one just by taking this product. Also, we can see that uh, the primary fields of the minimal model have the same fusion rules with uh, the easing onion model. And with the vacuum, the one, two with the easing onion and the one, three with the fermion. Uh, now we have all the tools to define the MuRead wave function. Here we are going to define uh, the wave function for uh, 2n easing anions located on uh, the eta coordinates. And we're going to also have 2m uh, fermions on the z coordinates. This can be built by just taking uh, a bunch of uh, operators of uh, 1,2 for the easing anions and then uh, 2m uh, 1,3 uh, operators for the fermions. Uh, here are uh, some comments, some remarks. Um, the first part is going to give uh, something, uh, is going to give a non abelian braiding and fusion rules. So in general, this is going to give uh, multiple channels. So this part alone cannot be interpreted as a, as a wave function because it's going to be a multi-value function. And of course, we have some uh, pole singularities that uh, we had previously also. Uh, now, this part is actually very important because uh, this one obeys a, a billion fusion rules. So it's going to be single valued. And uh, of course, we're going to have some uh, all singularities. This is going to be uh, this correlator can, uh, can be interpreted as a wave function only by demoting this. The function, they, they just have to be parameters. And on top of that, uh, to deal with the pole singular singularities that uh, I mentioned before. We need to include this uh, just factor that will cancel out these uh, singularities. And uh, therefore, that's how we get the, the wave function for uh, the z coordinates. And uh, what is very uh, uh, nice here is that uh, the conformal dimension of uh, this abelian uh, field is actually less than one. And it turns out that this is actually a requirement in order to get a wave function that describes an a, a gapped state. The, there is an energy gap here. Okay. So one might ask, okay, can we use different minimal models in order to get different uh, wave functions for different statistics? And uh, a first choice would be to study the model 5,4. Uh, this is motivated because um, if we take the correlator for the field uh, 1,2, it turns out that this uh, actually reproduces the braiding matrices uh, for the Fibonacci using F for the Fibonacci onions. So. Wait a second. These matrices uh, for k equals to three, they reduce to the Fibonacci braiding matrices. Uh, um, on top. The abelian fusion rules, which is going to be the one comma four. However, uh, we, we can uh, see that uh, this uh, has dimension greater than one. So naively, one can try to construct a wave function like this. 
of course we cannot uh, if if uh, if here we had used uh, a different choice of um, primary fields here if we had used uh, 1,3 instead of 1,4 then we wouldn't be able to define a single valid function so we cannot have a wave function so the only choice is to use this 1,4 but um, because the dimension is greater than one we cannot describe a energy gap state so this kind of uh, construction is a bit useless for topological quantum computation so instead of giving up uh, this uh, approach uh, uh, we we try to create a different uh, CFT which will allow us to construct a, a desired a well-behaved wave function this is uh, mainly motivated by realizing that uh, the minimal models can actually be constructed by this corset where here we have uh, these uh, SU2s at uh, different levels for the WZ w models and uh, we saw that uh, there are some similarities for, with uh, this model and uh, this uh, corset model and we're gonna from now on we're gonna call this equals two these two models are exactly the same actually they are theory they are not models sorry and uh, for a larger k we see that uh, these theories have some overlap for example the primary fields one comma s of the minimal models can also be constructed in the shift in the cost of cft and not only they can uh, be constructed but all the features are the same. They have the same conformal dimension, they have the same fusion rules and the same braiding statistics. Now, the advantage here is that uh, in the corset uh, CFT, we can define an operator with uh, a billion fusion rules and uh, conformal dimension less than one. Uh, well, before we talk about uh, that uh, new operator, uh, let's see first uh, how we can uh, uh, how can we uh, define amplitudes in the corset uh, CFT. So in general, if we take uh, n operators in the corset CFT, this amplitude is going to be uh, given by a product of uh, correlators in the k copies of the SU2 at level one times uh, an amplitude in the um, SU2 at uh, level minus k minus four. So we have k copies of uh, SU2 at level one and one copy at uh, SU2 at level minus k minus four. We are gonna call here uh, chi the primary fields for the first uh, type of SU2 and then Here, uh, of course, for the first one, for level one, we have a spin zero or uh, one half. And uh, this index i labels the many different copies of the SU2 that we have. And uh, for the SU2 at uh, level minus k minus four, we're only going to focus on uh, the spin zero and one half. Uh, now we can identify the field one comma two that we had in the minimal models by this uh, operator so we're just taking products of uh, operators in the as you do at level one and as you do at level uh, minus k minus four and notice that uh, this is not a unique definition because we have many copies we have this uh, index i but they are all identical. They will all produce identical results. So we don't have to worry about this. Uh, and if one uh, tries to find the correlator uh, in the cost of safety, he can uh, immediately realize that this is going to be the same as the 
minimal model uh, uh, CFTs. Of course, it's not surprising. Uh, this just means that uh, our theory <laughs> works the way we want it uh, to work. That's all. But, uh, well, let's, let's review a bit. Uh, I, I say that uh, for uh, k equals to 2, this concept gives the minimal model uh, 4,3. And for uh, k larger than 2, we have a new operator. And this new operator is going to be identified by this uh, equation. So here we're just using, uh, uh, in this definition, you can see that we're just using primary fields from the uh, SU2s at level one. So we don't use uh, the last type of SU2 at all. And because of that, it turns out that it's going to obey a billion fusion rules. And uh, one can actually try to uh, compute the conformal dimension, and he will. Uh, he can say that it's less than one. It's actually one half. Uh, now, using this tool, um, we can construct a coset wave function for two um, n uh, phi operators. These are phi with one. Uh, with the i, five, one, two operators, sorry. It's a bit uh, confusing notation. Uh, so we can have uh, 2n of these fields and 2m of these fields. And uh, well, this is going to be uh, the definition of the wave function. Well, actually, that was all it had to say. Well, I think I'm a bit. Uh, uh, do, do you have uh, questions? Are you with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Everyone was muted, <laughs> so I couldn't tell. Okay, sorry. Okay, so do you have questions, please? So, yeah, Ilya, so. Uh, yes. Uh, where do you think that you can uh, use this, for example, in, in practice? Uh, hopefully, we could uh, see some connection with uh, fraction, fractional quantum hole effect. So we know, uh, uh, for example, uh, wait a second. Uh, you can uh, still see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. All right. So we know that uh, on this uh, filling we have uh, Fibonacci onions, and uh, this construction, this wave function for. Uh, k equals to uh, 3 reproduces the Fibonacci, gives Fibonacci braiding statistics. So mm. one possible candidate that would definitely be a fraction of whole effect. So I'm not sure if uh, like there's some connection between uh, uh, this wave function and this particular uh, uh, state wait this one but uh well it's something that uh, we can try to investigate and uh the good thing about uh, this wave function that is that uh, we can generalize it to different even beyond fibonacci braden statistics Okay, since, since you talk about the, the fraction on quantum hole effect, uh, do you know how people reproduce these numbers, the fraction of filling uh, uh, numbers? What I know is that I don't really know the like, technical details or how they're going to like. Uh, construct a fraction quantum hole effect with a specific filling. 
So I don't know the technical details on that, but I know that uh, after they get a specific state, so they can get this state, like, but they don't know if this state corresponds to Fibonacci onions. What they are doing is that here you can create these quasi particle excitations and then uh, you can uh, move them around. You can create two and then you can move one uh, uh, around the second mm -hmm. one. And then you can uh, try to detect uh, uh, the phase uh, through interference. But I know that the, the, the precision of these results is not good at all right now. So that's why these are not conclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're all welcome. Other questions? So can you maybe do a kind of recap? So what was your starting point? You start from yeah. the minimal model or a free boson? System? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 so. So the starting point, so I think the, the recap is actually here. Yeah. So <laughs> in, in this cartoon. Yeah. So, uh, so with uh, this CFT, mm -hmm. because if you want to describe like if you want to like write down the wave function for uh, n using anions, then you are going to have uh, to get some uh, um, conformal block from this uh, CFT, and then you can construct the wave function. Okay, right. But of course, we don't really have this. Uh, like, there is some evidence that these anions they they, they exist in this uh, fractional quantum, quantum Hall effect state, but it's not very very clear yet so what we wanted to do is try to uh, use different conformal field theories mm -hmm. to generalize this uh, murid wave function so we have the murid wave function for the min coming from the minimal model uh, 4 comma 3 describing easing onions so we want to see okay can we generalize this wave function using different conformal field theories to get different braiding statistics. And well, I guess I didn't say that, but uh, it turns out that if you try to use different minimal models, like, so for k equals to two, you can actually define a wave function for the easing onions. For k equals to three, although you have statistics that looks like Fibonacci, you cannot define a wave function with energy gap. A different CFT that has some connection with the minimal models because of this overlap. And we saw that uh, in this CFT, you can actually define a wave function with energy gap. Well, of course, now the, the big question is in which type of system uh, you can see this uh, wave function, this construction, and this CFT, because this is all pure, pure theory and it's going to be like if, if, it's, uh, if it's something that is even like uh, has some like better va uh, like value it's it should be like a like a it's it should have some connection with reality right so otherwise it's just pure theory so yeah i don't know if that's a clear summary. so uh so just if you go one transparency back mm -hmm. this uh no um where you saw the the coset cft here Yes. So for k equals two, 
this is uh, SU2 cross SU2 over uh, SU2 at level 2. Or yes, S both uh, both uh, first uh, SU2 at level 1. Yes. SU2 level 1. It's level 1 times level 1 cross. Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's uh, this is interesting. And there is no the numerator level one see if this. Oh, because we have uh, well, I guess uh, yes, there are two same two. Because they are all the same copies, right? Uh, uh, we have many different uh, like, uh, definitions of the same quantity. For example, uh, here, uh, like a result of this uh, sort of symmetry is that uh, we have many ways to define this. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. primary field of the minimal model. I don't know if you're talking about something different because... Yeah, I, I mean, SU2 also, SU2 cross SU2 is uh, SO4, isn't it? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, okay, maybe that's completely nonsense. I'm not sure. I didn't. I didn't really work on that uh, like uh, further. So it might be interesting. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's true that it says so far, but uh, I don't know what is the meaning of that. SO4 over SU2. Yeah. Okay. Okay, are there any more questions, uh, guys? Maybe we can stop uh, recording. I guess there are no questions, so I'm going to stop recording now. Okay.